Thank you, Dr. Filner, for joining us again here this afternoon. <clears throat> and I think we're going to talk about Bell's palsy. All right, Bell's palsy, as I'm sure most of you know, is a uh, development that occurs uh, in for, for often for no apparent reason uh, in patients and uh, seems to be uh, mostly, most often, a temporary paralysis uh, of the seventh cranial nerve or the facial nerve. Uh, and uh, is often affects the eyelid, uh, an inability to move the eyelid and a droopy side of the face, and obviously it has to be differentiated from stroke uh, and from some other uh, areas. But uh, Bell's palsy is often self-limited. Uh, I, I suspect fairly often uh, is completely resolved, uh, although not always completely resolved. There are frequently patients uh, who have some residual that lasts basically forever. Again, depending on the circumstances that have caused the problem. Uh, in addition to uh, what we would say would be a uh, unknown cause for the problem, it's not a rarity uh, to have uh, the facial nerve compromised during its course through the uh, parotid gland, which is located up in this area, uh, and would uh, the facial nerve actually passes through. Uh, in addition, some of the other muscles, uh, in particular, uh, the uh, medial pterygoid muscle uh, can give you uh, some problems with the fifth nerve and occasionally uh, with some of the movements uh, that are controlled by the seventh nerve. And obviously you have to completely differentiate this by evaluating and looking at the masseter muscle, uh, both parts, the, the anterior and posterior parts of the masseter muscle, as well as the temporalis muscle to make sure that these are not related to the problem of weakness in these muscles. Uh, I've had uh, some success in treating uh, what appears to be an inflammation of the uh, chronic inflammation of the parotid gland, which would then allow for uh, this area to relax and not lead to the continued inflammation of the facial nerve as it passes through the parotid gland. I've treated a number of patients with xerostomia, which is dry mouth basically, uh, initially with problems. Uh, I used a microcurrent initially and now recently I've been able to use the low power laser over the submandibular gland uh, and the parotid gland and achieved a significant uh, increase in saliva. So that clearly there's an effect on these uh, uh, glands that produce the saliva and therefore if you treat the area where the seventh nerve passes through this uh, salivary gland, you may be able to resolve it faster. Uh, the likelihood is it won't resolve quickly, but we can perhaps accelerate it by following along the course of the facial nerve on the surface as to where it goes. If it's an inflammatory problem that's chronic, uh, may well respond to the low power laser treatment. And you're, you're using about three to five cycles of each point? Uh, as I said before, almost always <clears throat> I'll use five cycles just okay. to be sure uh, that we resolve the problem. And it should also be apparent that if this is an acute inflammation where we see redness and swelling, uh, the laser may not work at all and may actually exacerbate the problem because it increases blood flow into the area. So if the problem is chronic, uh, and with Bell's palsy, by the time you see it, it often is, uh, then one of the things one can do is to uh, use the laser along the course of that uh, nerve. One of the other things I might mention is that uh, occasionally you'll see a patient with an acute swelling of one side of the face. Uh, and most of the time in my experience of the last 30 years in treating these patients, is that this is due to very tight muscles of mastication and occasionally some muscles in the neck which have impeded lymphatic drainage of the face. And when you inactivate these trigger points and relax the muscles, 
sometimes within five or 10 minutes, you can see the swelling in the face disappear. So uh, some of this swelling may in fact affect the facial nerve and give you some of the signs of Bell's palsy. So that one should always look for myofascial trigger points in these facial muscles and uh, neck muscles that may affect uh, this particular problem. One of the other things that I might mention here is that the anterior portion of the trapezius muscle, a trigger point in this area refers not only up the side of the neck and around uh, the ear to the uh, temporalis area, but also to the angle of the jaw. And we know that whenever you have an area of referral from these muscular trigger points, that those areas may develop independent or secondary trigger points. So it's important to look at these places where there's referral pattern in addition to the primary areas where you can easily treat these with the laser, looking at these, and it's simply a matter of taking the time to examine the patient to see if there are trigger points there and then to say, uh, let's take the next three minutes uh, to resolve this. Some patients will often say, I have, oh, this little bit of a pain that uh, I forgot about. Can you treat that? And the laser will resolve it. Um, Dr. Filner, do you have patients wear glasses when you're using the laser in and around the, the face? Uh, it's, it's my habit most of the time not to, simply because I'm not aiming the laser at the eye uh, close by. If I go to the side, the laser uh, can't penetrate bone, so it can't affect the eye. About the only way you could affect the eye is if you aim the low power laser directly at the eye in a dark room where the pupil is dilated, held about a foot away from the eye. And obviously we're not gonna do that. Uh, the low power laser is not powerful enough to bounce off any areas in the room the way they might in the operating room uh, and affect either the uh, uh, people doing the procedures or the patient. Uh, we also can't start fires with the low power laser. So Dr. Filner, what uh, contraindications uh, do you think there is with the laser or are there any contraindications uh, using the, the ML830 laser? The, there are a few uh, relative contraindications to using the laser. Uh, I would not use it in an area that was acutely inflamed because it doesn't work and may actually exacerbate the problem not because it would damage anything. For medical legal reasons, one should avoid using the low power laser right over a pregnant uterus. Uh, for the same reason, one should uh, avoid using it directly over a thyroid gland, which may be symptomatic. Uh, if there's no symptoms there, there's no problem in using it there. Uh, the uh, a number of the anterior strap muscles uh, that attach to the hyoid bone uh, can occasionally have trigger points in them, especially the omohyoid muscle. And those can be treated without any problem and without affecting the uh, thyroid at all. Uh, and luckily they're not very common so that you don't have to deal with that. Okay, well, Dr. Filner, thank you so much for your time this afternoon and look forward to catching up with you again in the near future and have a great uh, meeting out here in San Diego. Thank you. I hope we can. Thank you, Dr.